Sarah Lee Whitson, Middle East Director of Human Rights Watch. Thank you so much for joining us to hang out. Hi. So we've been reading all of the reports on Syria on the Human Rights Watch website, and there seems to be a spike, just watching the Syria conflict, a spike in deliberate attacks on civilian targets. You guys have documented bombings and, and just attacks on bread lines, bakeries. We're hearing about attacks on hospitals. Why do you think that's happening now? Is it a sign that Assad's getting desperate? Is it a sign of anything? Um, well, I'm not sure that we could necessarily say that there's an increase in deliberate attacks on civilians um, because I think one critical difference is that we've seen the use of air power uh, where, in fact, we do see deliberate attacks on civilians in a way that we haven't seen prior to July 31st, basically. Um, and we also have, of course, increased access to the media, which has been made possible by the fact that parts of northern Syria are under the control of the FSA and media have been able to get in. So we have a lot more reporting on the uh, 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 terrible, terrible acts that are happening in Aleppo and other parts of northern Syria. But I don't think we actually know if that's an increase in what may uh, be happening or has been happening uh, in other parts of the country uh, for a long time. I mean, we do know, obviously, that uh, large parts of uh, Homs and Hama uh, have reduced to rubble. You've documented abuses on the rebel side. Some even say there have been war crimes on both sides. How do you see it, and how has it evolved over time? Uh, badly. Uh, badly it's evolved uh, in the sense that we have, in fact, documented very serious abuses by the FSA, and notwithstanding the uh, uh, declarations uh, by uh, the National Syrian Council, as well as cer certain leadership of the FSA, particularly those based uh, in Turkey, that they are uh, committed to abiding by international law. Uh, we know that the abuses against civilians, uh, kidnappings, executions, beheadings, uh, uh, you know, sort of vengeance attacks, uh, and so forth, uh, are, are continuing. And I think what is extremely and most disturbing, of course, is the extent to which it is being perceived and felt inside Syria as a sectarian conflict. Uh, and that's not how this uh, uprising started. From that respect, I mean, how do you look at Human Rights Watch post-conflict and your role? I mean, how do you look at monitoring those sectarian revenge attacks or anything? How do you brace yourself for what comes next? Um, well, I guess post-conflict would be the best possible situation to be in because post-conflict would mean that there would be no conflict and, and we could all focus uh, on the important and obviously very difficult task of, of reforming the state's institutions and laws, uh, reforming the governance of the country that has allowed it to sink uh, to where it is today. Um, but uh, uh, realistically, I think, uh, I think most people looking at the situation in Syria anticipate a long drawn out battle uh, because the government has support from certain segments of the community uh, who for whatever reason have uh, uh, decided to stand with the government and so it's not a situation where you know merely removing the head leadership uh, of the country as we saw in Libya would mean a immediate transition to something different. You've documented torture, even sexual abuse, rape in detention. What is happening and how hard is it to get those stories out? Uh, it's obviously very difficult, and, and in any conflict, not just in Syria, but anywhere, uh, documenting cases of sexual abuse and sexual violence are the most difficult because of the natural reluctance of victims uh, to speak. Um, but torture and abuse in detention and abuse in custody is something that, uh, it, sadly, we've had no problem documenting because it appears to be so pervasive. And I think it's important to note that the torture and abuse in, in custody, uh, arbitrary detention, is not something that is new to Syria. It's not something that's only happened in the past 18 months, um, but it has a long history uh, under President Bashar for the past 10 years, and of course uh, prior to that with his father. There's plenty of international condemnation. Everybody seems to hate what's happening. What is Human Rights Watch asking the world to do about it? Um, well, I think first and foremost, we need to see where the obstacle is to unified international action, the kind of unified international action that can make a difference as it did in Libya. And the obstacle there, I think as we all know, is Russia and its continued intransigence supported uh, by China. I personally think that China would change its position if Russia changed its position. Um, but uh, Russia has continued, I think, to uh, play this out as a regional conflict as a global conflict, as a contest between uh, Russia and the United States. Unfortunately, 
in, in a way that I think uh, neglects uh, most significantly the population that is suffering the most from the ongoing conflict and then suffering the most uh, by uh, Bashar Assad's continued uh, disregard for the most basic obligations uh, as, as a government and as a leader of the country. Uh, and so I think, honestly, Security Council action remains the most important uh, and effective measure that could be taken to stop the conflict uh, in, uh, in Syria uh, and to bring an end to uh, the crimes of the Syrian government in particular. Some calls for a humanitarian quarter, some cries for a no-fly zone. Do you take a position on what would be productive intervention? No, uh, we have not taken a position uh, on uh, military intervention uh, in Syria, and that is a very, very, very challenging decision uh, or recommendation for an organization like Human Rights Watch to make, uh, and one we make, you know, uh, extremely, extremely rarely. We hear these questions again and again, people asking us, how can we help, how do we get involved? What do you say to individuals who want to do something about the crisis? Well, I would uh, urge them to obviously continue to be informed and, and information and knowledge about the truth, about the facts of what's going on is critical um, because we are uh, seeing, of course, uh, continued propaganda and denials, uh, particularly in the Arab media where, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the defense of the Syrian government has more to do with posturing against the West than it does with any sense of, 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 of concern about the people uh, of Syria. Um, and uh, you know to, to lobby their governments and, and to lobby other governments, particularly Russia and China, uh, about how critical it is to take action. And I think we all have to keep in mind and remember that however uh, uh, the situation may look like now, uh, the uprisings in Syria started very much uh, in the same way that the uprisings in Egypt and Tunisia and Yemen did, which is a fundamental cry for the people of Syria for their freedom and their rights. Uh, and freedom of their rights that they have now paid a very, very steep pri price for and continue to, to, to be deprived of. Thank you so much, Sarah Lee Whitson of Human Rights Watch, for hanging out with us. You're welcome.